Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landa. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about TIAs, transient ischemic attacks. There's a tendency in the general population to believe that TIAs are benign and strokes are serious. But both actually increase the risk of disability and death. The syndrome of TIA and stroke actually just nothing more than polar ends of the same spectrum of disease. Stroke's going to occur in about 800,000 Americans this year. TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, going to occur in somewhere between 200,000 and 500,000 individuals. And 20% of people who have an ischemic stroke are going to present with the TIA in the hours to days before the stroke. So it's a warning symptom. Concept arose in the 1950s with the observation that people who had the ischemic stroke often had a TIA in the same area of the brain hours to days before the stroke. A TIA is a brief episode of neurologic or brain dysfunction. It's in a focal area of the brain. It's due to a loss of blood flow, ischemia, to the brain or to the retina, sometimes to the spinal cord. But there's no death of tissue. That would be an infarction. But it has the same underlying mechanism as an ischemic stroke where there is infarction. So when you have a TIA, that provides an opportunity to immediately start some kind of therapy, antiplatelet therapy typically, and to alter your lifestyle. And if you do that, you can significantly reduce the chance that you're going to have a stroke. So a TIA is temporary. It's transient. In the 1950s, it was thought that transient meant anywhere between 24 hours and about seven days. And it was thought longer than seven days. Well, it was a stroke. In the 1960s and 70s, concept changed. And it was thought that any symptoms lasting more than 24 hours, well, then that was a stroke. But now we've abandoned the 24-hour idea because on careful imaging, on diffusion-weighted MRIs, we find that about 50% of the people who have a TIA actually have an infarction, actually have some loss permanent loss of tissue. Most TIAs last only several minutes. Estimated 60% last fewer than 60 minutes, about three quarters less than two hours. It's thought that maybe about 10% may last more than six hours, but the diagnosis is suspect. And the American Stroke Association says, hey, if you have a TIA and the symptoms last more than six hours, you've got a better than even chance that you really had a stroke. About a third of the people who have TIAs that aren't treated going to recur, and about a third of the people or so who have TIAs going to ultimately have an ischemic stroke, but 80% of those could be preventable with appropriate therapy. Now, somewhere between 10 and 30% of stroke are preceded by TIAs, often during the same day. So that means if you have a TIA, you have to get treatment. You should get treatment right away. But if we look at the situation from the opposite, if we look at what percent of TIA is going to have a stroke, well, it appears that the seven-day risk, if you have a TIA, is about 5%. And it's highest in the first 24 hours. And as a matter of fact, about 20 to 50% of all events that occur in the three-month time period, well, they actually occur in the 48 hours after the TIA. Now, TIAs require symptoms. But you could have a stroke without any symptoms. So a TIA, a transient episode of ischemia without infarction, and we make the diagnosis on an MRI, a diffusion-weighted MRI. That re is required to fully diagnose the situation, since somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the people who were previously diagnosed with a TIA actually have infarction of tissue, permanent loss of tissue. So we've changed the diagnosis from just looking at the symptoms that the person had to now requiring imaging in order to rule out the situation being a stroke. Common usage, many people refer to TIAs as minor strokes, but the differential 
is determined by the diffusion weighted MRI. So re-emphasize that you can have a stroke either with symptoms or without symptoms. If you have a stroke without any symptoms, we call it a silent stroke, silent cerebral infarction or SCI. You can have permanent infarction on imaging without any observable symptoms. And that can occur either before or after a TIA. So the problem with diagnosing TIAs are that people often don't have any symptoms when they seek medical assistance. So 50% of the patients presenting to the emergency room or even to a doctor's office because they had a mild neurologic deficit might be of questionable diagnosis, might not be a TIA. Most common cause of TIA, atrial fibrillation, have blood clots that form in the upper chamber of the heart and then embolize to the brain. Could have atherosclerotic plaque, typically in the carotid arteries. You have more than 50% carotid stenosis in about 10% of the people who have TIAs, but about 50% of the people who have recurrent TIAs. Or sometimes we have impaired clearance of the emboli that's a relatively common situation. So the differential diagnosis is quite large. So a lot of conditions can mimic a TIA, hypoglycemia, or a person can faint, suffer from syncope, or have functional related problems because of anxiety, or maybe vertigo, or migraine headaches, or seizures, epilepsy multiple sclerosis or peripheral nerve entrapment or brain tumors or central nervous system infections, meningitis, or even subdural hematomas that can occur spontaneously in elderly individuals. So you're more likely to have one of those mimics if you have impaired memory. Chances are it's nine times more common in one of the mimics than a TIA. If you have a headache, that's four times more common in those mimics than the TIA. Blurred vision, about twice as common. But if we look overall at your symptoms, we find that TIAs are rarely associated with either headache or fainting or dizziness, loss of consciousness, ringing in the ears, tinnitus, or generalized weakness or chest pain or eye pain or confusion or dysphagia. But it's more likely that you had a TIA if you have weakness limited to one side of the body or transient temporary blindness in one eye or double vision, more likely a TIA if you have motor or speech problems, but that's not definitive. The differential diagnosis between those mimics and the TIA, well, the age. TIAs don't usually come on in young people. Migraine headaches tend to occur more commonly in young people. The nature of the symptoms, if you have migraine or seizure, the symptoms tend to be what we call positive. You have flashing lights and you have zigzag shapes and you have lines and images that appear. You can have pain and paresthesias and you can have jerking limbs. TIA mostly are negative symptoms. So you have a loss of hearing, a loss of vision, sometimes a loss of power in your extremity. The onset? Well, migraine tends to occur over minutes to up to about 10 minutes, positive symptoms, then you get the negative symptoms. So you have the paresthesias, the pins and needles feeling, they move from your hand to your forearm to your upper arm, then you get the numbness. TIAs are abrupt in onset. The duration syncope, if you faint, lasts for just several seconds. If you have a seizure, it's less than five minutes. Migraine with aura, somewhere between maybe about 10 and 30 minutes, TIAs last up to an hour. You can have some precipitating events. So if you have a seizure, it might be because you were hyperventilating or you drank too much alcohol or took some medicine. Syncope or a faint might be because you see some blood or you have an emotional event. A TIA, well, it could occur suddenly after you stand or after you took a antihypertensive medicine, blood pressure lowering medicine, or after a large meal or a hot bath. You can have speech changes, depending on the kind of speech changes, whether you have altered word use or grammatical structure, that's one area of the brain. If you have slurring of your words, that's a different area of the brain. But it's important that the diagnosis is appropriately established 
And we have to do that to avoid unnecessary expense and anxiety and labeling and treatment. You don't want to take treatment forever if you don't have the TIA, if it was an inappropriate kind of diagnosis. But even trained neurologists have difficult time differentiating those TIAs from the conditions that can mimic them. But if you did have a TIA, another important reason to know about it is that it increases your risk of suffering a cardiovascular disease, a heart attack, an acute coronary syndrome, within a period of about a year. So if we go out five years, and people who have TIA, well, the incidence of heart attacks is the same as strokes, is the same as sudden cardiac death. So how do we diagnose them? Well, it's on the basis of symptoms. They're exactly the same as a stroke. It's sudden onset, maximum symptoms at the start. It's not a gradual, progressive course. You don't have those recurrent stereotypic movements that you would in a stroke. You have a weakness or numbness on one side of the body. Could be the face, could be the body. Usually it's on the opposite side from where the actual brain lesion is. You could have a sudden dimming or the loss of vision called amaurosis fugax, where you have painless, temporary loss of vision or double vision. You've got to have difficulty speaking or understanding language. Could be anywhere between 20 and 30 percent of the people. Slurred speech. You could have drooping of one side of the face. Think it might be a facial paralysis, Bell's palsy, but it could really be a TIA. Confusion problem with balance or spatial orientation. Symptoms oftentimes gone by the time a person reaches medical care. There's no test for TIA, no gold standard. We have to rely on an observer's account. There's significant disagreement between doctors. Even stroke trained neurologists have difficult time arriving at the distinction between is it a TIA or is it one of those mimicking factors. As a matter of fact, about 60% of people who were referred to TIA clinics actually didn't have a TIA. They had one of those other common mimicking factors. Well, the most common abnormalities that we find on physical examination are the person has dys diplopia, in other words, double vision, hemianopsia, in other words, they lose half of the sight of vision. They have monocular blindness. In other words, they lose complete sight in one eye. They have disconjugate gaze, where the eyes don't go in the same direction. Nystagmus, where the eyes go back and forth. Facial droop, or moving the tongue laterally when you stick it out, goes to one side. Difficulty swallowing. Some difficulty with balance. Have difficult time putting the finger to the tip of the nose or the shin to the heel, difficult time walking. Typically, the symptoms go away when we have the spontaneous breakdown of the clot, of the thrombus or the embolus. Sometimes we have the collateral circulation. TIAs are rarely due to critical arterial stenosis. It isn't a permanent narrowing of the vessel. That's typically not the problem. But when we examine people, when we talk to people, it's important to get the exact definition of the word. So sometimes people mean different things when they talk about, well, it felt numb or it felt dead or it felt heavy or it felt weak. Now we're learning that after a person has a TIA, after a person gets better, well, they can have some cognitive complaints. They can have mild cognitive impairment, anywhere between about 30 and 90 percent of individuals. It could be severe in anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of individuals. It's worse after a stroke than it is after a minor stroke, and worse after a minor stroke than it is after TIA, and it's all due to the vascular impairment, and especially occurs with executive function. So your ability to pay attention or the information processing speed, it's not part of the typical workup. But we're learning that this condition, the cognitive impairment, is a relatively common situation, especially in people who have anxiety or depression or delirium. We have the hemiparesis, the weakness. That can give us an idea of where the situation is. If a person has aphasia or a transient loss of vision in one eye, well, it might be the carotid circulation. On the other hand, if a person has 
bilateral weakness of the limbs or vertigo or hearing loss or sees double, diplopia, might be the vertebral basal circulation in the back of the brain, but adding some degree of confusion is if a person has the emboli from atrial fibrillation, could be anywhere in the brain. So we have some factors that are involved that are non-modifiable. You can't change them. The older you are, the greater your risk. You can't change your age, sex, family history, genetics, race or ethnicity. But there are some modifiable factors and you can change whether you're a cigarette smoker or not. You can treat your high blood pressure. If you have diabetes, you can go on a diet or you can treat it appropriately. If your lipids are elevated, you can bring them down with medication. Your activity level, most people are sedentary. If you get up and move about, that's a significant benefit. Obesity is a risk factor. And the level of carotid stenosis is also a risk factor. So if we add them all together, for instance, if we take a black or African-American male who's over age 85, that individual has about a 16-fold increase in risk versus the average in our society. Hispanics have a higher risk than Caucasians in the group between 45 and 60 years of age. So the likelihood of a stroke after a TIA was often defined by what's known as the ABCD2 criteria. Well, A is for age, B is for blood pressure more than 140 over 90, C is for clinical features, so unilateral weakness, you get two points, speech impairment without the weakness, you get one point, and 1D stood for duration, more than 60 minutes, you get two points, 10 to 60 minutes, you get one point, diabetes, you get a point, add them all together, anywhere between zero and seven points. It was thought to be very reliable, but now we recognize that it doesn't tell us anything about the likelihood of carotid artery stenosis or tissue damage on the MRI or the likelihood of a recurrent TIA, but it's thought that if you score on the ABCD2 somewhere between six and seven, then you're at high risk. That means that you have about a one in 12 chance of having a stroke within the following two days. If you're at medium risk, score four to five, then you have about a 1 in 25 chance that you're going to have a stroke within the next two days. And if you're at low risk, where your score is anywhere between 0 and 3, then the risk of a heart attack in the next, uh, I'm sorry, the risk of a stroke in the next two days is somewhere about 1 in 100. Now, most people fall into the moderate risk category. Some people, however, who are in the low risk category can have atrial fibrillation and then they're at high risk. So if we look at TIA patients, if they have a new infarction that we diagnose when we do the diffusion weighted MRI, then those individuals have a two to a 15 fold increase in their chance of having a stroke within a very short period of time. And if we look at vessels that are obstructed on the MRA, well, those individuals have a risk of stroke that's increased by about fourfold. So rather than the ABCD2 criteria, now we switch over to the Rotterdam criteria, and it's kind of difficult to make the diagnosis in any circumstances. But we need some history and physical. So the history is somebody, a bystander or a family member, can give us a clue as to when and how long and what the time course was what the onset was, the duration, the resolution, what were the precipitating events, what were some of the risk factors, does a person have a family history of stroke, TIA? Do they suffer from some sort of hypercoagulability? Is it blood clot more frequently? We do some neurologic examination, of course, check the blood pressure, Check the electrocardiogram, see if the person has atrial fibrillation, sometimes do a halter monitor or an echo in order to see if the person maybe has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Check the oxygen saturation, make sure there is no pulmonary emboli, blood clot that went to the lung that caused the same kind of symptoms. 
check the blood sugar to make sure you don't have hypoglycemia, check to make sure you don't suffer from anemia or excessively high red count, that the platelets aren't too high, check for coagulation, check for the lipids. But most importantly, we've performed some kind of imaging. Now the CAT scans are much more readily available than MRIs, but MRIs are preferable. Because remember, in up to 30 to 50 percent of people who had TIA, they actually had an infarction can have actually more than one area of the brain involved and up to a third of the people the area involved on the MRI isn't the area that we thought from the clinical examination. But we also check the vessels, check the vessels that could be a MR angiogram or a CT angiogram, could be just a carotid ultrasound but unfortunately for the carotid arteries, the ultrasound doesn't really give us a whole lot of clue as to what's happening after the bifurcation, after the interior and the exterior carotid arteries split from each other. Well, finding out where the vessel is or what kind of vessel abnormality or what kind of cardiac valve abnormality a person has can give us a clue as to what kind of therapy is best used. Now, there's a tendency in our society to want to do a lot of testing and you hear these ads on the television suggesting that you could have a carotid ultrasound exam and that should just be a routine screening but the United States Preventive Services Task Force that sort of guides medical policy in the country in a non-biased way they say for the average asymptomatic adult population that's a bad test you shouldn't have it done and actually the harm of some sort of intervention in the general public is greater than the potential for benefit. Now, if a person's had the cardiac imaging and we still don't have an explanation, but it seems that it really was a TIA, well, it might be possible that there's an opening between the right and the left atrial chamber, the upper chambers of the heart. We call that a patent foramen ovale. That could be evaluated by a special kind of an ultrasound. Maybe there's a problem with hardening of the artery of the aortic arch. That can be detected too. Well, let's begin some kind of therapy. And the therapy might be prevention. So prevention, lifestyle modification, healthy diet. If you have a healthy diet, you might be able to reduce the risk of progression by 30 to 40%. That means decrease the salt in the diet, have a lot of fruit and vegetables, have some low-fat dairy, some whole grains, limit the red meat and the sweets, avoid tobacco. If you smoke, that increases your risk of progression by somewhere between 200% and 400%. Cut down on excess alcohol. If you're taking some stimulants, probably a good idea to stop. Sympathomimetics, cocaine, any of those sort of things? Absolutely not. Healthy weight is very important. Exercise is important. Mediterranean diet might be able to reduce your risk by about 60%. Some degree of physical activity can reduce your likelihood of progression somewhere between about 25 and 30%. And high intensity exercise might decrease your risk by about 65%. Then we have treatment. Treatment can reduce your blood lipids, your cholesterol. It's probably a good idea. The LDL, however, is more commonly associated with heart attacks than stroke. You have antihypertensive treatment. 70% of the people who have stroke have hypertension. So if we reduce your blood pressure, if you happen to have a TIA, maybe we can prevent your progressing onward. Well, up until 2010, tried to keep the blood pressure less than 140 over 90 now. There's a tendency to keep the upper number less than 130. If you have diabetes, that increases your risk, especially if it's uncontrolled. So the best way to control diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, is of course go on a diet and get some exercise. If you do that, then you might not be diabetic anymore. But some of the drugs, Invokana, Ozempic, maybe metformin and Actos can help reduce your risk somewhat. If we look overall at risk reduction, High intensity physical activity can reduce the likelihood that you'll progress from a TIA to a stroke 
by somewhere around 65%. Treating high blood pressure can reduce the risk by about 30 to 40%. Taking an antiplatelet drug, maybe 20 to 30 or 40%, or a statin drug, maybe 15 to 20 or 30%. Then we have the antiplatelet drugs. Right away, if you have TIA, then you should begin, unless there's medical reason not to, you should begin uh, an antiplatelet regimen. An antiplatelet regimen could just be taking aspirin. You could take 81 to 325 milligrams of aspirin, or you could take the uh, Plavix, that's clopidogrel, or you could take the combination of aspirin and the Plavix, or the generic variety. Or you could take aspirin and dipyridamol, that's presantine. You could take them together in one pill, that's called Agronox. There are a variety of other kind of medicines that you can take. Now, if you happen to have atrial fibrillation, the exception is that instead of the antiplatelet drug, then you probably should take an anticoagulant drug. That would be a drug like warfarin or the so-called NOAX, the novel oral anticoagulants of Eliquis or Pradoxa or Xeralto or Cervesa, those drugs, sometimes combined with the antiplatelet therapy, well, they're going to increase the risk of bleeding. But it might be warranted if you have significant coronary artery disease and atrial fibrillation, if you have external I'm sorry, if you have the, the, the extracranial carotid stenosis and you have somewhere between uh, an 80% and a 99% blockage, well then maybe it's appropriate to have a carotid endarterectomy. That can decrease your five-year risk of having an ischemic stroke by as much as 50%. If you only have a 50 to a 70% obstruction, well, the benefit's much less. It's only about a 15% reduction. If you have less than a 50% occlusion, well, it's probably not going to decrease your risk, but might actually increase your risk if you have some sort of a surgical procedure on your carotid artery. And for people who are over age 70, endarterectomies might be, where you have surgery, might be preferable Whereas for people who are less than 70, maybe stenting is uh, more appropriate, especially if you have severe cardiac or renal disease. We like to do the stenting instead because it's less major. Or if you have uh, bifurcation where the split between the internal and external carotid happens to be very high in the neck, then might be that stentings are preferable. Or if you've had previous surgery on your neck or radiation in your neck. Well, revascularization it's important, but remember, the carotid stenosis causes only about 10% of TIAs, but it causes about 50% of recurrence, the early recurrence. So if you have the stenosis and you happen to have good surgeons, well, then some sort of invasive procedure might be appropriate if the death rate is less than 1% and the incidence of stroke in the hands of the surgeon less than 2%. So basically that's the story of TIAs. They're a call to action. They're a sign that the brain's at risk for potentially long-lasting and more devastating events. But they need to be properly diagnosed since the symptoms often disappear before you get to seek medical care. And many people think that since the symptom only lasted for 30 seconds, 60 seconds, or two minutes, that, well, it's not really a reason to go and rush to see a doctor. And we know that oftentimes the symptoms are confused with a variety of other medical disorders. So if you experience a TIA or if you have neurologic symptoms that are unexplained, it's a good idea to seek care and seek care quickly because that could reduce the likelihood that you're going to go on and develop a stroke. Now for the overwhelming majority of people it's important to modify the diet and correct the blood pressure and go and do some exercise and avoid cigarettes. That can decrease the risk of a stroke by 60 to 80 percent but you need something quite quickly and that means typically either aspirin or clopidogrel Plavix and you should start taking that right away. And if you have atrial fibrillation, then it's an anticoagulant. That's the warfarin or Eliquis or the Xeralta or the Pradoxa. And the most important thing is,
if you have unexplained neurologic symptoms, go and see a doctor and do it quickly. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend and su consider subscribing so that you'll be notified as we post new shows. Anyway, I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.